Hi, my name is Rebecca Strayer. I am a licensed professional clinical counselor with Naya Clinics. In today's video, I will be talking with you about the four types of attachment styles. Um, so we'll go over where attachment forms, how it develops, um, what the four styles look like in different descriptions of each one, and then how to make sure we have the healthiest attachment style possible in our current relationships. So to start, attachment actually begins very early on in life. It's really the first goal we ever have. Um, between the age of zero to two, that's really our main purpose is to figure out uh, for our psyche how to attach to our garden. And even in um, developmental psychology, the goal is trust versus mistrust. It's the same thing with that, is that how do I attach, how can I make sure that I'm getting my needs met with my relationship. The interesting thing about attachment is how we form that first attachment typically will be the same pattern we have throughout our lifetime. Um, and that is if we don't try to actually make changes, um, especially if we have an unhealthy attachment to start and we don't make changes to make it healthier. Attachment is really the blueprint to all of our relationships, how we will function in those relationships, what we will do whenever we're experiencing crises or conflict within the relationship. And so, like I said, there's the four different types. And so, with each type, I'll go into a little bit about what it looks like in childhood and how that type develops, um, but also what it looks like in adulthood as well. Um, so, we'll start with secure attachment. And so, there's the four types. We have the secure attachment, and then we have three types that are considered insecure. Um, and so with that too, the secure is kind of what we want to strive for. Um, it's very much that sense of stability in a relationship. And that's the, by far the healthiest form of attachment. We also have anxious attachment, which you might hear as ambivalent attachment, um, angry attachment, things like that. It's all the same thing. Um, and that's more like the hot side of it, the, the red side. And then you have avoidant attachment. Um, and that's more of the cold or the blue side, you would say. Um, and both of those are part of the insecure attachment styles. And then finally, we have disorganized. And disorganized was actually developed later on because they kept saying that these kids weren't falling into um, any of the original three. And so they developed a new one, disorganized, because it didn't really fall into any of them. Um, and it's basically that the whole system is kind of chaotic because it is disorganized and how we attach. Now I'll go into more detail about why that is in a little bit. Um, but think of attachment a little bit more on the spectrum that we can kind of fall in with in any area of the spectrum, that we might sometimes be mostly secure, that might be more of our baseline, and we might fall more on the anxious attachment whenever a crisis hits, or something like that occurs, or when something um, might trigger that response to us. And so keep that in mind as well, that it's not you are stuck here forever, necessarily. But then we might have a little bit of each one, depending, um, or a little bit of a, of a mixture, I guess you would say, depending on the circumstance. So to start off, we'll talk about secure attachment. Um, so, like I said, from zero to two is when we form attachment. For kids and babies during um, that stage, whenever they are learning secure attachment, it's very much that I cry, parent comes in, they're able to soothe me, and I'm able to learn how to self-soothe as a result. Um, that I can get my needs met and trust that my needs will get met through relationships, through human contact. Um, and then in um, a popular study that was done with Mary Ainsworth, um, she took I believe it was mostly all mothers, um, and their child, and would have the mother leave the room to see how the child responded. In securely attached children, the child would respond by being upset when the mother left the room. Um, they might cry, but you show the typical signs of being upset. Um, and that would typically last a few minutes, but then they were able to self-soothe and self-regulate, um, distract themselves, whatever it might have been, to be able to calm themselves down. And then whenever the parents returned, they showed affection towards the parents, showed excitement that they were happy that the, the parents was back. In adulthood, what this looks like then is um, we are super clingy to our partners. We're able to be independent. However, we still have that interdependence as well. So we feel that we are better as a team, but you can still have your thing. I can still have my thing. Um, we trust that if I am feeling upset, that I had a bad day, that something bad occurred today, and I look at my partner for support, that I will receive that, and I can trust that. Um, that I know that I have that security for my relationships. And so that's kind of what we want to strive for in general, is that more of a secure attachment style. Um, the next one we'll talk about is anxious attachment. And like I said, I think if you're that all the few different things like um, ambivalent attachment, uh, angry attachment, whatever. So with anxious attachment, that's again in the beginning years of our life, that would be when we cry when we show that we need um, soothing and our parent is not able to fully give us that, that we, they might try, but we end up being disappointed in some way that it may not actually work for us. So the example I like to give with this one is for a child who is called me, or even for my own um, example, I was black as an father. And so when I cried, 
parents would, what most parents do, that they would try to feed, they would try to make sure I was alive, whatever it might be. But then, whenever they would feed me, I would end up getting more sick, causing more of the uh, stress hormone in my body, more issues with that. And so that can easily lead to that anxious attachment that even when somebody does try to show me that, um, that support, I love feeling um, insecure that they're able to give me that, that I'm not going to be able to get my needs met at that point. And so in adulthood, this comes out as more fluid relationships. Um, the angry side of it will be, I want you to support me, I need, I need you to help me, help me feel regulated, but then I don't trust that you'll be able to, and so I feel angry at having someone towards me. And keep in mind, if you're a parent listening to this, there's no parenting book, like there's no right or wrong, and the fact that you're even listening to this is a sign that you are trying to be a good parent. Is so trust yourself that you're not trying to screw up your child or anything like that. So please don't take it that way. Um, but there's a lot of things outside of our control that can also impact attachment as well. And so also with the anxious, anxious attachment, knowing too that it is very much that we still want to have that attachment, but we don't trust that we'll be able to get our needs next to it. On the flip side of that is the avoidant attachment. And like I said, that's more like how the anxious attachment is more the hot, the red area. Avoidant is more the blue area that I try to get my needs met. I know that I'm not going to be able to, so I'm going to have to figure this out myself. So this was the child in uh, Mary Ainsworth's study that the parent would leave the child one really respond to it. Parent came back, child also didn't respond. Very much the independent mindset. Um, I think of very rigid boundaries with people with more avoidant attachment that I do not believe that people will help me get my needs met, so I will get them met for myself. For a lot of people, they see this as a beneficial thing. However, when you look at just psychology, sociology in general, as humans, we do our best and we strive when we have relationships, when we have those connections and we feel safe relying on others. Typically with avoidance, we do not trust but other people will be able to do it, so we do it for us. And so same thing in romantic relationships, for example, this will rarely be the person that shows the emotion first. Um, so they won't be the person to say, I'm lucky first in the relationship. Um, they're not the ones to always say like, oh, I'm going here, I'm going there, this, these are the plans, they're more, you know, this is what I'm doing. And, you know, you can do whatever you're doing, I'll do whatever I'm doing. It's very much an independent mindset. And then the last one, disorganized attachment. So disorganized attachment we see mostly in kids that have been through neglect or abuse. Um, again, with disorganized attachment, that this wasn't from the original three, but this was the child that did not know how to respond to the parents because the person who's supposed to soothe me, the person who's supposed to help me de-stress as an infant is the person causing me harm. So the person I can't trust to be safe. And so this will come out through outbursts that the child may even be upset, but being upset can lead to more trauma and lead to more abuse, um, which then in adulthood, as you can imagine, leads to that conflict whenever. So I'm upset about something in a relationship, but then if I've ever been upset before, that means I get hurt, or the person who I love is supposed to hurt me. And so there's a lot of chaos in how we figure out how to attach in that style. Again, that's disorganized, and I'm stealing this actually from a podcast um, called Therapists Uncensored. I highly recommend it if you like this video. Um, they go into a lot more detail about each attachment style. But one of the ways they describe it is that think of a GPS system for you know, secure attachment. Type it into your GPS, it takes you directly there, you're good. Um, in anxious attachment, it's more the okay, well, we're going to go down this road, but that doesn't seem right. But we're, so we're getting there, but it's not in a way that we feel good about. Um, in avoidance attachment, I'm not taking any highways, I'm avoiding the toll roads, all that. Um, but then in disorganized, it's constantly on recalculating. It's not being able to commute, or compute, excuse me, not being able to kind of figure it out. And so you will never get from A to B because we cannot figure out how we get there. There's that disorganized piece of it. And so with these, keep in mind that we will still show these patterns unless we're purposely trying to change them. And so in disorganized attachment, one of the best things in overcoming that is being aware of just being able to see that, okay, this is why I do the things I do. This is why, um, so for example, I had a client who had a lot of trauma in early childhood and identified as having disorganized attachment in adulthood, where if someone said, I love you, she would become extremely angry. Um, she found this as a threat and would go into that fight or flight mode as a result. And so for her to be able to see, like, this is why you're doing that. This is why that fight or flight response is um, being triggered. And so through that being able to also make those changes while maybe I want to run at this moment, okay, I need to self suit I need to breathe, and then I need to do the opposite of what that action urge is in that moment. For avoidant attachment, it's again, the same thing of awareness, but also being able to see 
how can I put a little bit more trust on others? That might start even with sharing a little bit more with my partner about my feelings. For a lot of people with more avoidant attachment, I recommend doing this through like a journal or something like that where it feels less vulnerable in the beginning, but I can put my feelings down where somebody else can see them. The other piece of avoidant attachment too is going to be, again, pushing yourself very much to work on trusting others, to give somebody a task that it might even be the uh, having your spouse pick up the kids that day. And even though I don't trust I'll get done, I need to start doing these things to kind of work on that piece of it. Um, to let myself trust that other people can be there for me. To be able to communicate my emotions and receive that that um, support in return. For anxious attachment, this would be because a lot of times when we are in, in that anxious attachment mode, we feel clingy, we feel needy. And so the best thing to do is to turn to that inward. To focus on what is it that I need, what is it that I'm doing, instead of focusing on everything else the other is doing. And like, well, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, or I need to be doing this, and you're not focusing on okay. Well, what am I doing about this? What do I need in this moment? Because a lot of times with anxious attachment, we are getting focused on the other person. Another sign of anxious attachment is that we put the other person's feelings as our responsibility. So that might be that my husband comes home from work and we had a bad day, and I make the assumption, what did I do wrong? Maybe I just maybe I was supposed to have done something today and I forgot to do it. Maybe it was something I said last night and I'm still loving him today and it must be my fault then. Instead of being able to separate that and being able to see he's allowed to have a bad day, it doesn't mean it's about me. And then with all those being able to kind of take it from that insecure to more about security. And so part of that will be being patient with yourself. Also being aware that your partner might be falling into one of these. And so being patient with your partner as well. Being able to see that we all can again fall into one of these categories on the spectrum. And so being aware of not only for us, but for others, that they may also be struggling with that. And so being able to be in patient with one another, as well as yourself. Um, like I said, if you are interested in this a little bit more, check out Therapist Uncensored, the podcast. Highly recommend it. They get a lot of um, extra material as well. Um, I hope this video was helpful. And feel free to reach out to nineclinics.com um, if you have any more questions or would like more information on therapy services as well.